So I'm super excited for this talk today because I think the work both these people are doing is really, really special. Um, how many of you are familiar with uh, a video from VR chat where a kid who is embodied as Kermit the Frog shares his uh, anxieties and, and trouble at school? I am like 4'9", four 4'10", four and that's really bad for a 15-year-old. When I'm walking, you'd probably think of me as like a 10-year-old. You probably think I was like 10 or 11. And most of my friends now, they don't get asked if they need a kid's menu, but I do. I know that's not a big thing, but it just shows, it just like lets me look into the public per perception of me, like when I just go about my daily life. You get a good deal that. on the kid's menu. You're saving money. Okay, good, so we got a few. Um, you're among the closing in on six million people who have seen that video. Uh, that is one of Sermer's um, kind of gonzo journalist acts within social VR, and it just turned out, first of all, it just turned out that Sermer lives in Toronto, so he could be here, kind of like his like debut to the VR world as a, as a real person, not, a, not an avatar. Um, <laughs> And he did a video with DJ, who's a pastor, who they conduct, DJ ha has been doing um, services in social VR for about a year, and did actually a, an on-camera, obviously it's in social VR, baptism of somebody within social VR. So it's a pretty powerfully interesting use case for VR. So before we dive into that, that conversation, kind of looking at that power and that intimacy in social VR, I'll just have them briefly introduce themselves and share a little bit about their background, um, and we'll go from there. So Sir Moore, start with you. Uh, I'm Sir Moore. Uh, in VR, I'm usually a small black and white cat, uh, which makes me much more approachable than what I appear to be in real life. And uh, I started doing like social VR interviews when I was in VR chat and this drunk Finnish man uh, started having existential crisis in front of me. And um, after like, you know, just talking to him for a few hours as, you know, he was having a rough time, I was like, well, that was a very real human interaction I just had. And uh, prior to that, my interest in social VR only went about as deep as sort of the gimmick of it and I didn't really see much actual human depth in it up until that point. But uh, after sort of having that conversation, I've spent about a year now uh, just sort of like interviewing different people in VR about their life and just uh, having casual conversations. And I met Soto when I sort of wanted to start doing videos on practical applications of VR or VR being integrated into everyday sort of social norms like, uh, well, church services, which yeah, sure. um, yeah, my name is DJ Soto. I'm the lead pastor of Virtual Reality Church. Uh, we're the first church to exist entirely in VR. And uh, we're on this uh, Altspace VR platform. That's where we've been gathering for a little over a year. And uh, we're just a small VR church doing our thing. And then Wired Magazine wrote an article about the first church in VR. So they, you know, that brought a lot of attention uh, with Today Show and, and, and CNN. So things kind of died down. And which was great because you know we just loved what we were doing in VR. Uh, just a little background: my wife and I were pastors at an actual physical church in Pennsylvania, pretty a large church there, it's a mega church in in Pennsylvania. So we were ordained ministries, ordained ministers, a part of that ministry. But um, you know, fast forward to I don't know, I guess 10, day, 10 days ago when you released that video, it's yeah, ten days. been about that. And uh, you know, we did a baptism in VR. Um, we, we've done those before, but uh, Sir Moore had invited me to come over to VR chat to do a baptism. So we went over there and baptized uh, Drumsy. And uh, since then, it's been crazy for me. I don't know about you, but it's been <laughs> yeah. pretty uh, BBC Radio, the, the Daily Show with Trevor Noah, and all those. Everyone's kind of fascinated by the whole idea. I mean, the, well, the video that you, you created was fantastic and beautiful and just, um, but also too, this is crazy side to it because there's Winnie the Pooh and there's, you know, Sir Moore the Cat and all that. And but, at um, the end of the baptism, SpongeBob comes in and absorbs all the holy water. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but if, so if you watch the video, it's amazing. I love how you did it because you're just, you, you get kind of lost in the story of what's happening and you forget about, um, you know, Winnie Pooh's there and you're just kind of in the moment. And then SpongeBob runs off, and you're back into the absurdity of it all. So um, no, we just we just loved it, and um, it's just been a crazy week for us personally. But um, yeah, it's the the nut and bolts of who we are. 
And I heard him call you Soto. Do you prefer DJ or Soto, just so I don't? Oh, whatever. Yeah, DJ, Soto, whatever. I'm not a DJ, but right so I can't mix for your club. You're a spiritual DJ, though. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. Um, and we're actually lucky to have DJ because you were here for, what was the name of the conference you actually you came for originally? Yeah, I was invited to uh, Waterloo, uh, Faith Tech. It was an uh, organization over there. Um, and they didn't know a whole lot about VR, so I just kind of did some demos and talked about our church and played Beat Saber, of course. So. As you must. So he just happened to be in town. That video just came out like a week, yeah, 10 days ago. So it's like kind of this beautiful serendipity that's, that's kind of emerging. So I want to start kind of at the bottom because I want to make sure we've set the tone right. So when we're talking about social VR, there's a bunch of different social VR platforms. It's basically the way we're gathered here. There are platforms that we can do that in VR and kind of embody ourselves. And Summer, your background's not actually in journalism and ironically, you're producing some of the best journalism in, from within and about VR. You're going to make me blush. Oh, wow. Yeah, in your, uh, in your cat avatar, you don't have that, that, no, that concern. Do you don't, that. You don't blush. Cats don't blush. Um, so I want to kind of start right at the bottom and, and sort of, you referenced getting into this sort of for the gimmick after you gone to Knuckles. There was a moment where there was this sort of like infamous troll moment where a bunch of little Knuckles avatars were running around trolling people um, in kind of a, an appropriated, inappropriate uh, accent. Um, and that kind of like was sort of an inflection point for you because you discovered VR chat and you were kind of wanting to go find those moments. But then you ended up finding other types of moments. So walk me through what that process was like, going and looking for the kind of zany, trolly moments and finding more human moments. Yeah, so like, Social VR sort of is like a wasteland of poor moderation. So like if you go into a public world, it's going to be a mixed bag of like, you know, kids screaming in their mic and then maybe like a few people that actually want to have a conversation. And that's just because, you know, it's such like a shiny, colorful thing that it's going to attract people who are just there to see like, oh, what's this all about? And have no interest in going deeper than that. So, um, Basically, how I find people is just like, I'll just talk to people in a public world, and you know, half the time I'll get, you know, a person not interested in talking or a person who's going to be, uh, I guess, inappropriate. But then, like, occasionally, like, there will be a very real occurrence where you have a very human connection with another person in social VR, uh, I guess. And one of the ways like that's possible is that when you're in social VR, a lot of your physical identity is stripped away. And a lot of people might argue something like, when your physical identity is stripped away, then a sort of like a pure version of yourself might come forward. Um, for example, I did an interview with this kid who uh, has a condition called the butterfly disease. Can't remember the actual medical term for it, but basically it means that his skin is so sensitive that uh, if something like a shower is very painful for him. And so uh, when talking to me, he talked about how in real life, people sort of like give him weird looks and look at him a little funny because you know his skin is very badly damaged and his hand, uh, he basically doesn't have fingers anymore. His, his fingers have fused together. But in VR, there's none of that sort of physical context. He can interact with people without the initial judgment they might have about him, and that sort of allows him to be sort of a pure version of himself and people to interact with him in a pure way without, you know, early judgments. And not necessarily that, you know, people look at him and think, like, negative things, but just like a natural, uncomfortable reaction people might have in real life to this boy with this horrible disease doesn't exist in VR. So one thing that was really interesting about that video, he embodies as Piglet. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of kind of like recurring characters you're used to. And there's this really touching moment in that video where he kind of just looks up at the sun. And it's because he doesn't really have a lot of uh, chances to go be out in the sun as 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 a physical person. You're looking like straight at the sun. Are you trying to blind yourself after looking at just? <laughs> my since my skin is so fragile, just by just by hugging me, my skin will just scrape right off. Instead of like doing a handshake, I'll just do a fist bump since I have like stumps. I just can't do the uh, fist bump and then like the blowing up of the hand. You know what I mean? 
That's like a, a, a cool bro thing that I usually see on like TV shows or YouTube videos. If I was able to do that, that'd be cool. But I don't really care, to be honest. That's even cooler. And so it's kind of opening up gateways for people to experience things that they can't necessarily experience in the real world. And um, DJ, I know that you've had that experience as well with some of the people that come to your services and to come to your baptisms. Could you share a little bit about, about that? Yeah, it's, a, it's actually um, just moving to us because many people who come um, can't physically go to a faith experience. Maybe they're in a wheelchair. Uh, one gal has a, a condition I can't even pronounce and she can't leave the home. Um, and there's another gal, uh, she severe social anxiety. So you have these, you know, many different reasons. Um, and our church gets a little bit of criticism, at least in the evangelical American side, because people are like, uh, you know, you should go to the, you should go physically go to church. And I'm like, well, that's fine, but some people can't. And um, when we baptized Alina, she was, she's homebound. And I remember her coming up out of the virtual waters and she was crying. And she said something to the effect of, I never thought I'd be able to do all this again. I never thought I'd be able to go to church or get baptized. And, you know, regardless of maybe your, your theological uh, sensibilities, it was such a, like a, a beautiful moment that even people that come in to criticize it or to disregard it see Alina's baptism and see her story and are actually quite moved by it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, it's an amazing thing that social VR has allowed people not just to... Um, I don't know, just attend an event, they can now participate. So Alina, uh, we, we became an orda ordaining body and we ordained Pastor Alina to ministry and she's leading, she's actually leading a church service right now in VR uh, for one of our services. We have multiple throughout uh, on Sunday. And think about that, like a year ago, homebound, you know, uh, no relationship um, as far as faith community, which she wanted outside of her home. And now she's actually leading a church. It's, it's insane what social VR has allowed people to do. And Summer, your actual process when you're, when you're finding these people, because a lot of us, like, we would think, like, what do you just walk up to people randomly? Like, are you going on Reddit? Like, what is that process? How do you find these people? And what is the kind of way that you approach a conversation with a total stranger? Uh, so my VR interviews are conducted probably, well, they'd more or less be impossible to conduct in real life because when you do street interviews in real life, you go up to a person, you probably have a few sets of questions you might have, and they're probably too busy, or if they have a, you know, if they do have time, they only have time for the questions you have prepared. Uh, but what I do with my interviews is um, I'll talk to people anywhere from two to ten hours, and I'll basically start the conversation with them. I'll like sort of build up a rapport with them, and at some point in the conversation, usually they already know who I am or what it is I do. And if not, I'll explain what it is I do, and I'll go, "Do you mind if I start recording this conversation, and then maybe I might upload it to my YouTube channel?" Da 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 da. da. And they go, "Okay, sure." And so, none of my interviews or conversations ever have a guiding point. We just sort of talk about life or whatever for hours and hours. Sometimes, you know, it gets really late and I have to continue the conversation the next day. And uh, we just sort of see where it goes and that sort of allows for, you know, more natural storytelling because there's no real guiding point to what's happening. And, uh, you know, it's not the most practical thing because it eats up a lot of hours, <laughs> but uh, it works for what it is. Well, the freeform quality really shows and like interacting with you in person, I have a better understanding of why people are willing to share with you because you have a nice way of never forcing a conversation. You never force it to go anywhere. You just kind of, you'll have a follow-up question or you'll kind of sit and meditate and think on it. And I can see where they start to just share more and more and more. And, and I think the, the long length is what actually allows you to kind of get those gems. So now really quickly to talk about the craft side of things, What's your process for editing this for 2D, to, like, to, to draw out what the juice of that conversation was, that 10 hours, down to something like 10 minutes? So when I edit it down, the video footage after recording it in VR chat, I actually just edit the audio of it. So instead of like watching what it visually looks like, you know, seeing these colorful characters like a Kermit the Frog and Winnie the Pooh having a conversation, uh, I just concentrate on the actual audio of what's happening. And then when you, you know, put it together and watch it visually, you, you have a very, you know, real 
human narrative from the story or the things they talked about, and then it's jarred against these weird, colorful aesthetics. You know, like I had someone who used an avatar that was like Sans from Undertale, dressed up as like a K-pop star, and they talked about how their girlfriend had passed away, and it's just like a very weird mix of uh, you know just very human things in a very odd, colorful world. So. How did you two meet, by the way? How did you decide to do this thing together? Uh, it started off going like, you know, I want to record people doing stuff like marriages in VR or, you know, therapy in VR, just like real world applications in VR. And I was like, I wonder if anyone's ever done a baptism in virtual reality. So I just started Googling like online pastors, stuff like that, and I actually saw that DJ Soto had already been doing baptisms in VR for quite a while. And so DJ, what was it like, because normally these are, these are ephemeral moments that you're sharing with people the way we do in the real world, but fewer cell phones to take pictures and, and videos. Like you have total control over if there's any video output. What was it like working with Sermer? Oh, uh, it was a blast. I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I'm usually in the alt space metaverse, and so, and I do come into VR chat every once in a while, and that's a completely different experience. So if, you, if you've experienced those two, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So um, I hadn't been to VR chat in a while, so when he talked about baptism, I went to the, the world where there was water, and I was just blown away by how the visual resolution and fidelity of the water and how it just, I moved my hand with my Oculus Touch controller, and the water would just ripple along with me very uh, just a beautiful moment. I even recorded it, did a test, put it on YouTube, and people were, were responding to that, like, looked at, like, that looks amazing. And even just testing the baptism out, I just went underwater, and it just feels like I was going underwater. So um, it was just a, a great process, because I think the platform allowed for an amazing experience. You picked a great world to do it in. And then working with Sir Moore, um, like you were saying, is very approachable, uh, very conversational. So it just made for um, you know, just an excellent experience. So looking at social VR's power to draw out this different type of intimacy that doesn't exist in the real world and it doesn't exist in the 2D web, you both have very different experiences, so I'd love to hear from both of you. What's been special about your interactions with people in social VR? Obviously, we have the kind of extreme examples of people that you know, have conditions that disallow them from participating in the real world. But what about just the, the normal stuff? I guess one of the things I like about social VR is that you're, it really simplifies the dynamic you have with different people. Like for example, uh, this past week I had a conversation uh, with a 70 year old man who, you know, is essentially doesn't have much too much time left, he's suffering from ALS, and uh, in real life I, there's next to zero chance that I'm ever going to go and start a conversation with a 70 year old man I see on the street. But in social VR, he's just like a happy smiling mushroom. And well, he's much more approachable that way. And there's no, you know, there's no barrier between us age wise, at least, you know, visually. So just sort of connections I've made with different people in social VR wouldn't have been possible in real life or would have been extremely unlikely in real life. And I sort of owe a lot of connections I've made to real people or real friends I've made to social VR. Yeah, I think, I think for us on, on many levels, um, one of the criticisms we get is that w won't people be fake in VR? Don't, you know, there's an avatar that are going to change themselves to be someone they're not. And I said, actually, it's the opposite. There, there's something about that avatar and the anonymity that leads to deep authenticity. You're kind of talking about that a little bit. And we find that to be true. So one example would be I was, we, my wife and I, we travel with our family all over um, talking about VR Church, but um, I was at my friend's house in Arizona and I was leading the service. And a kid came up to me, I think it was from Boston, and immediately uh, just wanted to start talking about you know, his struggles with depression and su suicide attempts and all of those things. And my friend was blown away. He was like, he just met you like 30 seconds ago. And I said, yeah, if I could take that moment and multiply it like times 100, if there's just something about the platform and the avatar, the anonymity, and that people just feel more comfortable just getting right to the heart of the matter, uh, more comfortable being themselves. And um, it, it really is phenomenal. And uh, you know, my wife and I have been like in the physical world, you know, part of church ministries for forever, um, over 20 years, and we've never experienced the conversations that we're having in VR. But maybe not never, but it would take a long time to get there. Um, you would have to build that trust, that physical connection, which I think is very valuable. 
Um, but in VR, it just you know accelerates. So we're just talking about those deep issues right away. So to that point, Sirmer, um, I know from talking to you offline that you've got some pretty cool stuff in the works directly related to what he's talking about. Can you share a little bit about where these new ideas around intimacy and populations that you want to work with? Uh, yeah, so VR allows a lot of people a, sort of a form of a therapy, essentially. You know, They talk about things that they wouldn't talk about in real life because of lack of social consequence or maybe a few other factors. And uh, because of that, uh, something I've talked with people about now is wanting to get people into VR who might not naturally end up in VR uh, on their own, just as a way for them to you know, talk and communicate with other people and share things that they might not normally share. So uh, one of the projects that's being worked on right now uh, with Jesse actually is getting um, incarcerated prisoners in the United States into social VR uh, to have discussions and sort of answer questions and uh, beyond that we've uh, sort of just been brainstorming other different ideas of getting uh, different types of people into VR that wouldn't normally find themselves there to also share their experiences because even though Getting a prisoner into social VR, you might think like, you know, what's the difference between that and just interviewing them straight up with a camera in real life in a room? But that whole experience of just being in a virtual space where you control your avatar, you're in a colorful place or an environment that you control, just gives you a different type of feeling that allows you to share in a way that you might not normally share. And I think getting, uh, you know, again, incarcerated prisoners into that sort of environment than sort of the small room uh, media person might interview them normally would be pretty game changing. And the reason that that project is so exciting to me is that it's using VR obviously to create deeply human moments that we might not otherwise be able to experience, but also you might be able to kind of wiggle in and create systems change. You might be able to say, well, prisoners are given a, a phone call. What if they could be given a VR visit to, with their loved ones? What if we could do skills acquisition and education using VR in a way that's you know, less expensive or less threatening for a prison in terms of letting physical people onto the premises? Um, speaking of physical people, you two met virtually first, and I know that you're actually kind of doing this thing where you're trying to go meet people that you've had really resonant interviews with. Um, of the people that you've met in person that you first met virtually, what was that like? Yeah, so if any of you have ever used social VR before and then met someone in real life afterwards, it's not like you are meeting them for the first time when you meet in person, it's just an extension of your already existing relationship you had in VR. And that's sort of, I guess, like a very beautiful thing because all those hours really did mean something emotionally even if it wasn't a physical experience. DJ, how about you? Um, yeah, I think that um you know, well, like what like you were saying, it's, it's, a, it's actually very valid. And uh, for us, we've met several people throughout the United States um, for the first time. I mean, they've been leaders of our church, not just attending, like leaders and, and elders, and we've met them for the first time. And exactly right, it's a continuation of where you left off. Um, and it, that's, I think, maybe what surprised me the most. I was like, wow, this is so fascinating that we're just meeting up for a cup of coffee and just like we've always have been and just continuing the conversation. So, um, yeah, it's very beautiful. So I know you've mentioned that um, some people in your, in your physical professional community have met your work with resistance. They, they don't see the virtual space as one where faith and, and sort of that magic can occur. What methods are you using to try to soften them or to try to kind of prove, like are you using examples like meeting them in person? Like wh wh how are you addressing that? Yeah, it is a challenge, and not to be like weird, but like it's like that point in the Matrix when Morpheus tells Neo, "You can't explain what the Matrix is; you have to experience it for yourself." Right? And man, I, I wish I could. Uh, like, well, let me give you a quick story. Is I met a pastor, totally against what we were doing. Didn't know that. I was like, "Hey, come to VR church with me." Put him in the VR Oculus Go. Afterwards, he was like, "Man, I want to do this." So whatever happened in that little moment, you know, completely changed his mind. So. I think for us, it's stories, like telling the story of Alina, how she's now empowered um, 
to be a leader in a church and to be baptized. And I think those stories soften it up so I can see, I've definitely met resistance. And once they've heard those stories, I see that like, all right, well, maybe, you know, so um, I think that's, those stories are powerful. Okay, so final question for both of you, since you've both been doing this enough to love the platforms, but also probably have things you wish that you could do or, or have, whether from the 2D content creation standpoint, all the way to, you know, you mentioned in VRChat having more sort of higher fidelity water than you have in, in alt space. What are the things or what is a thing that you're really looking forward to, a development you're looking forward to seeing kind of come down the pike? Um, I guess the only thing really would be a more dynamic camera and virtual reality. But besides that, I sort of like, I really do like where social VR is right now, even if for a lot of companies it's hard to monetize it. I like the very bare bones feel of it, and I feel like if it was more cluttered, it would sort of bog down or distract people from the actual social aspect of it. Like if I compared two games, Rec Room to VR Chat, essentially they have the same tools, they both have the tools to socialize with others. But Rec Room has more features, and those features just end up being distractions from the socialization. And so, again, in theory, you should be able to have the same types of conversations, but you don't. Um, I think for me, and maybe I'm a bit, a bit of a nerd by saying this, like after reading Ready Player One, by the way, anybody read Ready Player One, just out of curiosity? <laughs> a few hands up there. I, I don't know, after reading that, I was like, man, the metaverse, that is what I want to be in, in the future. So uh, for me, I, no, I agree, the, the metaverses now exist are really compelling and uh, good experiences, but I think for me, looking forward to that day where, where the true oasis comes in, if in, or when it does, um, that's just the geek in me hoping that will come someday. <laughs> I think everybody in this room probably, probably agrees. Well, thank you both so much, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.